The test had gone horribly wrong. It was supposed to be a quick and simple test. Activate the Philadelphia Drive, dematerialize the spacecraft and ourselves from our universe, materialize at the target universe, gather some data, then return to our original one. NASA had reassured us that this would not take more than 10 minutes to do this, start to finish. This was the first test after all, so they didn't want us staying in another universe longer than necessary. So our goal in this test was to get as much data as possible from the target universe and return immediately, thus paving the way for future missions. I have to admit, I was very excited at first. I was already happy to be accepted into the program, but to be part of the first mission to cross into another universe made me ecstatic. The idea of being one of the first humans to cross universes thrilled me and I felt so proud to have been chosen. Years of learning about the Philadelphia Drive and training for the possible rigors of interuniversal travel had finally led to that moment where I and my crewmates would make our marks in history. If everything goes as planned, we would return as heroes. However, things didn't go as planned. Everything was normal at first. In fact, it felt exactly like the training and practice runs which we had rehearsed hundreds of times. As the pilot of the spacecraft, my job was to make sure the vessel and all its systems were working and fully functional. Going through the checklist and communicating with mission control on Earth, I checked and double-checked all systems until me and the flight controllers on the planet were satisfied with the data we were receiving. I didn't have much of a role on the operation of the Philadelphia Drive itself, as that was regulated to the mission commander, the chief engineer, and the senior researcher on board. However, I, and the rest of the crew, had basic knowledge on how it works, as well as its basic maintenance. We are being sent into another universe and so NASA, and its habit of having backups and backups for the backups, ensured that every member of the crew had to know how to operate and repair the device in case of emergencies. Once all system inspections were conducted and completed by all stations, and as the final minutes before the drive's activation ticked by, mission control conducted one last check to see if everyone was ready for the mission. Listening to the comms network, I smiled in satisfaction as each flight controller gave a hearty approval for the mission to proceed. Fido. Go. Guidance. Go. Capcom. Go. Surgeon. Go. Network. Go. Drive. Go. On and on they went, going through each station, until fellow astronaut and current Capcom, Will Hardy, said the sweet words we had all been waiting for. Heart of Gold, this is Houston, you are go for Philadelphia Drive activation. Roger that, Houston. Mission Commander Larry Johnson replied, before the crew a thumbs up with his gloved hands. Smiling at this, I then looked at the mission clock and saw that there was only a minute left before the drive was activated. Making sure my seat straps were tight and secure, I then looked at my control panels and made sure that the ship systems were still good. At the time I don't remember feeling scared. Excited. Yes. Scared. No. Maybe this was because NASA had sent out an unmanned spacecraft to the same target universe and had managed to return said spacecraft unharmed. Data collected from those missions had concluded that travel to another universe was safe for humans and I think that was enough to assure me that everything was going to be okay. To me, at least at the time, the safe return of the unmanned spacecraft and the positive data it gave was enough to convince me that interuniversal travel was safe. At the same time, I guess I was too drowned in excitement to feel scared. Like I said, first humans to cross to another dimension. The target universe we would be going to, and the one which the unmanned spacecraft had visited, was one that was very similar to our current one. It had Earth, the Moon, and the rest of the solar system was just like the one we have now. Everything in that universe was like ours. 
Well, except for the fact that Earth had no humans, at least according to the previous mission. Scans from the unmanned spacecraft had revealed that aside from plant life and some animals, the planet was devoid of intelligent life. Because of that, it made that universe the perfect test bed for future missions, since NASA didn't want to make contact with humanity in another universe, at least not yet that is. As the last seconds counted down, and as the Philadelphia Drive began powering up and shaking the spacecraft, I gave one last glance towards the moon we currently orbited and knew that I would soon be seeing a different moon from a different universe. All right, everybody, get ready. Commander Johnson called out as I returned my gaze towards my control panel. Activating drive in 3, 2, 1. Flashes of light of every color shone through our cockpit window as I felt my whole body shake from the vibrations the spacecraft was making. Around 50 meters behind me, through various halls and compartments, the Philadelphia Drive was doing its job and transporting us from our universe to our target one. I felt no pain as this happened and the shaking was actually very mild. In fact, launches from ground to space actually felt more violent than what I was experiencing as we jumped from one universe to another. However, during this process, something wrong happened. An alarm suddenly screeched, which was followed by another, and another. Chief Engineer Harlot McKnight was the first one to report. Commander, one of the drive's cooling systems has malfunctioned. He said, as I scanned my control panel to see that smoke had been detected in the compartment where the drive was stored. Checking the monitor that showed a live video feed of the compartment, I saw that the important drive was the cause of the smoke, as a chunk of it seemed to be missing and torn apart. However, before I could report this, senior researcher, Dian Lincoln spoke up. The drive has overheated and a portion of it has blown up, Commander. She said in a calm voice, as if there was no danger to the news that she had just told us. The system is now undergoing an automatic shutdown and is powering down. I suggest that everyone get ready, because we're about to materialize. Materialize where? Commander Johnson asked, as he activated the extinguishers after I finally managed to report to him about the smoke detected in the driver's compartment. Before Dian could reply, we were then violently thrown forward as the bright colorful lights shining from our cockpit suddenly disappeared. Thanks to our straps, we were held secure to our seats. However, a sudden and painful headache struck me immediately, as I groaned from the sudden pain it caused. It felt so bad that I wanted to open my helmet and press my hand firmly against my forehead. It took every strength of willpower within me to resist this urge, as I knew that it was not wise to open a helmet without first checking if the compartment was completely pressurized, since there was no telling if the spacecraft took any structural damage from the jump. However, the pain was hard to ignore and it momentarily paralyzed me from doing my duty. To add to my pain, I also felt extremely dizzy, as I fought the urge to vomit. It was terrible and I wondered what could have caused this sudden sensation. Managing to turn my head and gaze towards Commander Johnson, I was surprised to see that a pained expression was also plastered on his face. Willing myself to look towards my back, I saw that Harold and Dien were also in pain. I found this strange, as headaches and nausea were not supposed to be felt after a jump. At least that was what NASA told us. So either this was a side effect that we were just not discovering or there was something else to it. The pain somehow subsided long enough for us to regain some composure and check up on one another. Once this was done, Commander Johnson questioned Dien on where we were. I don't know, Commander. Dien finally said, a reply none of us expected. I had hoped that she would say that we had materialized back in our universe or maybe even in the target universe. But to not know where we ended up brought a chill down my spine. It seems like the explosion somehow disrupted the jump and knocked the drive off course. She reported, 
as she worked her computer to check for our location. We're now in a new universe that isn't in NASA's records. Oh, God, this place is completely devoid of stars. This caught my attention, as I looked out of the cockpit window for the first time since we got here. What Dian said was true. This universe outside was really without stars. Looking out with awe and fear, I found myself staring at nothing but an empty canvas of black. It felt terrifying staring at it. Space was supposed to be filled with the bright glow of celestial bodies, it was never empty. So to see it like this, so dark, so barren, it made me feel so small and isolated. I never knew such a simple void could be so terrifying, yet it was. Pushing my head closer towards the window, my eyes soon darted around to try to look for anything in the darkness. But there was nothing. It was empty. It seemed like there was nothing in this universe but us. Eventually, I managed to pull myself out of the trance of staring at the empty void and return my attention towards my crewmates. I don't like this place. Commander Johnson finally said, a hint of fear and frustration in his voice. All right, what is the extent of the drive's damage? Can it be repaired? I'll have to check it out first before I can answer that, Commander. Dian said, as she began unbuckling her straps and prepared to go check on the drive. She had been one of the scientists who had helped develop the drive itself, so there was no one else on board who knew it better than her. All right, take Harold with you and report to me as soon as possible. Roger that, Commander. Harold said, as he began unbuckling his own straps. However, by that point Dien was already floating out of the cockpit and making her way through the hall that led towards the drive's compartment. I better call on the rest of the crew to see if anyone was hurt by what happened. Commander Johnson said, as Harold left the room. The crew at the lower deck had been quiet since the drive's activation and Commander Johnson was starting to get worried for them. Go check on the spacecraft and see if we took any other damage from the explosion. Checking the spacecraft, I was relieved to see that no other damage seemed to have occurred. Inspecting the drive's compartment. I reported that there was no structural damage or leaks in the room and that there was no more smoke detected in it either. However, Commander Johnson seemed too busy and distracted to acknowledge my report. Looking towards him, I watched as called on the rest of the crew through the local comms network. But there was no reply. Despite constant calls for them to report in, the four crew members kept quiet. Finding this odd, my first instinct was to check the camera that gave us a look of their compartment. However, Instead of the usual sight of four suited astronauts in their seats, I instead saw nothing but a black smudge. It seemed like something was smeared on the lens, but I wasn't exactly sure what it was. Getting increasingly worried about the safety of his crew members on the lower deck, Commander Johnson ultimately decided to personally go down to see if they were all right. Ordering me to stay in the cockpit and monitor the spacecraft systems, he then unstrapped himself and floated out of the compartment. With that I was left all alone, with my headache slowly coming back again. Knowing that the compartment was now safe and airtight, I momentarily lifted my visor so I could rub the aching spot on my forehead. But it was no use and it gave me no relief. The pain was still there and it seemed to get worse by the second. Wanting to distract myself from the pain, I decided to look out the cockpit window in hopes of making my mind focus on something other than the pain. However, I would soon regret this decision, as I saw something that terrified me more than I was earlier. I had expected to see the empty void once more. But this time there was something floating in space was a head. But it wasn't just a head, it was my head. I backed up on my seat as I saw this, as I felt fear run through me. Staring at it with frightened eyes, I found myself looking directly at my own eyes, which stared back at me with a cold and soulless gaze. 
I couldn't believe it and I had to blink my eyes a couple of times to make sure what I was seeing was real. Right in front of me, floating in the cold vacuum of the void, was my head. It looked so alike to me, yet at the same time I could tell that there was no life in it. It was terrifying seeing that, but I couldn't help but keep my eyes fixed on it. Both curiosity and fear were surging through me, as I wondered how a copy of my head ended up out there. What had created it? How was a copy of my head made so quickly during the short time we had been here? What was it made of? So many questions circled my mind, as I felt the headache hit me once more. Feeling the powerful wave of pain surge again, I instinctively pushed my hand to my forehead to meet the oncoming rush. However, instead of touching my forehead, I was shocked to feel nothing but air. Eventually, my hand ended up touching the inner back part of my helmet, before I suddenly withdrew my hand in fright. For a moment I was in disbelief. But then I brought my hand back into my helmet and felt nothing. I pulled back my hand, before putting it in again. Then I did it again and again and again, as I felt my stomach drop in horror. As I stopped inserting my hand into my helmet, I slowly looked out of the window and once more gazed outside to see that the head was still there, floating freely while its cold stare was still directed at me. I began to fear that the head floating out there may not just be a copy of my head, but instead my actual head. That shouldn't be possible. In fact, it made no sense. Yet, I couldn't explain what had just happened. Somehow, this universe has done something that wouldn't have been possible in our own universe. My mind was clouded with confusion and fear at that moment, as I sat there staring. I can't remember how long I stared at my own floating head, but eventually snapped out of the trance when I heard Dien call out in the local intercom. Commander, this Dien. She began. The damage to the drive doesn't seem too bad. It just needs a simple replacement of some parts. I already have Harold getting the spares as we speak. There was a pause, as Dien waited for a reply from Commander Johnson. But the comms remained silent. Commander. Dien called out again. But once more there was no reply. At this point I was starting to worry for the commander. I hadn't heard from him since he went down to check on the crew and there was no way for me to check on him from the cockpit. Fearing for his safety, and the safety of the crew on the lower deck, I decided to check on them and see what was going on there. After informing Dien that the commander had gone down to check on the lower deck crew, and that I hadn't had communication with him since he left, I then told her that I would go down there also and see what the situation was there. I deliberately neglected to inform her what I saw outside the ship and what had occurred to me, since I did not want to distract her from the meticulous task of repairing the crucial drive. I wanted her to focus on her task so we could get out of this universe as soon as possible. Besides, since I was going down, I would eventually see the commander and the chief medical officer, who would probably be better suited to help me. With that in mind, I pulled down my visor, unstrapped myself from my seat, and left the cockpit without looking back at the head that I knew was still staring at me. Making my way through the spacecraft, I went through the hall and pushed myself down the tube that led to the lower deck. However, upon reaching the hall that led towards the crew compartment there, I immediately knew that something bad had occurred. The hall was dark, far darker than it should have been if the lighting was turned off. Looking around, I noticed that the wall panels were covered in something strange. Deciding to move closer towards it, I observed that it was some sort of skin coating it. Repulsed by this, I quickly drew back, but ended up pushing myself too far and hitting the panels behind me. Sticky substance soon stuck to the rear of my suit, and I turned around to see that the fleshy skin that covered that panel was leaking the thick liquid from pores that dotted its surface. Trying my best to ignore the creepy-looking surface, I decided to stay strong and continue on towards the crew compartment. However, as I floated towards its hatch, 
I noticed that the skin-like material seemed to cover all the panels of the hole. Luckily, the hatch itself didn't seem to be covered in it, so I was easily able to pull it open to peer inside the compartment. What I saw was not what I expected. Like the hall, the compartment's wall panels were covered by the fleshy skin. However, it was much more disgusting, as the flesh here was not completely covered in skin. Some parts had muscles exposed. In fact, the skin on some portion seemed to be floating next to it, as if peeled and with only a small portion left connected with the muscle. It was a horrifying sight, but that was not the main thing that caught my attention. Flattened on the panels there were four faces, eyes looking and staring at me. Staring at one of them, the face gave me a teary-eyed look, as its mouth tried to move in an attempt to speak. But no words came out. Instead it just continued its mouth movements, as it opened and closed, while a pained look plastered on its flat face. Soon the other three faces did the same, as they all looked at me with desperation. It soon dawned on me who these were and I couldn't possibly imagine how this happened to them. Whatever was happening here was beyond the understanding of an ordinary person. This was not just another universe, this was something much more terrible. This was hell itself. Feeling overwhelmed by the terrible sight, and wanting to spew out the contents of my stomach, I soon began moving away from the compartment of faces and away from the fleshy hole. Making my way back up towards the cockpit, I rushed in to find that the skeleton of a human sat on the commander's seat and worked the various controls around it. Like everything else that has happened so far, it was unnatural and defied all the logic I knew. As I watched it for a few more seconds, I noticed it mutter something, as its jaw moved up and down with each sound. Trying my best to listen, I heard it repeat the same line over and over. We must get out. We must get out. We must get out. The voice sounded familiar and my eyes soon widened as I recognized whose it was. It was Commander Johnson's voice. I was shocked to see what had happened to him, but I no longer questioned how he turned into a skeleton. This place, this universe, was doing things to people. It seemed that it did not like our entry into its realm. Against my better judgment, I decided to slowly float behind it, moving closer and closer. As I moved towards him, I tried to call out to him, but there was no response. Instead, he just repeated the same line he had been muttering. We must get out. We must get out. Once I was floating just behind his seat, I cautiously patted him on the shoulder, trying to get his attention. I then saw his skull swivel and I thought that he finally noticed me. However, instead of facing me, his hollow eye sockets instead turned towards one of the monitors on the control panel. This monitor was for one of the cameras facing towards the aft and as I gazed towards it but saw nothing. All that was there was empty space. Switching my glance back towards the skeletal form of the commander, I looked on as he continued on staring at the screen. However, this time he was quiet. I didn't know what to do or what to say. Everything that has happened so far had been terrifying and exhausting. When the commander finally spoke again, he said something different from his earlier muttering. It's coming after us. It's coming after us. It's coming after us. This sent a chill through my spine as my heart began to race. I glanced towards the screen once more, but still saw nothing but the darkness of space. This frightened me even more, as the fear of the unknown made the situation feel much worse. For a moment I wondered what exactly the commander was seeing. With this universe capable of doing things beyond our simple comprehension, there was no telling what it could produce to come after us. Images of gigantic planet-sized beings or engulfing black holes came into my mind, but I knew that this place was capable of making horrors much worse than that. 
Eventually, a call through the comms by Harold interrupted me from my thoughts, as I heard his concerned voice through my headset. Commander, this is Harold, are you there? The commander is busy at the moment. I decided to reply, thinking that he also shouldn't be distracted from the task of repairing the drive. I know this was a stupid and selfish thing to do, but it also spared me the great effort of explaining the unbelievable horrors through the comms. It would be better and easier for them to understand if I told them face to face, so I thought that it was best for them to wait till they were done with their task. Oh, well, is Dien over there with you too? This worried me. No, I said. Isn't she still there in the drive compartment? She's supposed to be. But when I got back with the replacement parts, she was gone. So I assumed she went back there to check on something and, wait, hold on. My worry was beginning to increase now as I moved back towards my cockpit seat to check the monitor that displayed a lice view of the drive compartment. Checking the room, I saw Harold float from one corner of the room and inspect a portion of the drive. Trying to see what he was looking at, I noticed that the previously blown up portion of the part was now covered by a, a fleshy substance. Due to the camera angle, I couldn't see exactly what was plastered on the fleshy substance, but the sight of it clearly spooked Harold, as he backed away towards the corner of the room. There's a face on the drive. He screamed through the comms. A what? I said, although I could already imagine what he was seeing. I already had an idea whose face it may be. In my mind, it couldn't have been too different to what I saw at the lower crew decks. Before he could reply, I suddenly felt myself be gently pushed back against my seat, as I saw Harold drift towards one of the walls of the compartment. Surprised by this, I scanned the panels to see what was happening and quickly realized that the four propulsion engines at the rear had been ignited and set to 100% power. Confused, I looked around and eventually looked towards the skeletal form of Commander Johnson to realize that he had engaged the engine and was now pushing the whole spacecraft forward. Propelling the spacecraft forward. Looking ahead to see where he was pushing us towards, I saw that my floating head outside the spacecraft was now pressed against the cockpit window. I don't know how it managed to stay on that one spot, yet it somehow did. From there, it stared at me with the same soulless gaze from earlier. Trying my best to not be trapped into the cycle of staring back at those eyes for too long, I tried to look past the head to see what lay ahead of us. But there was nothing there. It was only empty space, the same emptiness that surrounded us on all sides. However, despite the emptiness, the commander seemed to be seeing something in it. We must get out. We must get out, he said, as his white bony arms began moving across the control panel, while his thin skeletal fingers began flipping switches. Observing him as he worked, and too confused and scared to do anything else, I soon realized that he was activating the drive. For a moment, uh, this made me wonder if the drive was fully operational. Dien and Harold had not been able to replace the blown portion and I was unsure if the strange occurrence that had happened to it counted as a repair. But the commander did not think of that and did not seem to care. Instead, he kept on muttering the same line over and over again, as he worked through the necessary procedure to activate the drive. Sitting there next to him, I allowed him to continue. It felt like we had no other choice. It seemed better to try the drive and die attempting to escape than remain stranded in this universe of horrors. Eventually, the commander got the drive to power up and this immediately resulted in an awful scream to run through the whole spacecraft. Initially, I didn't know where it came from. The terrible agonized scream seemed to be emitting from everywhere. Pain and terror seemed to be contained in it, as it grew louder and louder. As it kept on rising as the drive continued to power up, a small realization hit me. Managing to look towards the monitor that observed the drive compartment, 
I caught a glimpse of what was happening there and saw that the fleshy substance on the drive was starting to smoke. To me it looked like meat on a heated pan. At that moment I felt sorry for Dien. The pain she must be feeling must have been unbearable. To be burned alive like that was something I wished I would never experience. Her screaming eventually reached its highest point once the drive was in full power. I wanted the terrible pain cries to stop, but there was no way of doing that. So instead I tried to distract myself by staring out to our front, to see that my head was still pressed against the cockpit window. However, instead of the dark emptiness of void surrounding us, a familiar flash of bright colorful lights had now replaced it. I felt ecstatic and hopeful once I saw that. It was working. The drive was working. For a moment, I managed to shut out the cries of Dien and instead felt joy shot through me. We were finally leaving this universe. The horrors it had brought would finally be gone. Feeling the spacecraft shake as the drive did its work, I let my mind be lost in happiness and the thoughts of home. Watching with glee, I looked on as the pressed head on the cockpit disappeared, as a bright flash of all colors engulfed my whole view. Feeling myself be shoved forward, I was then violently thrust forward. Since I was not able to strap myself before the drive was activated, my body was flung forward, as my helmet smashed against the control panel. This resulted in my visor breaking, sending shards of sharp material to my face. Feeling the stinging pain of the cuts, I instinctively brought my hand on my face to check my wounds. As I did this, a realization hit me. My hand was touching my face. Instantly, this made me pat every portion of my face, as I was relieved to have my head on me again. I felt even more relieved when I saw a familiar white moon just outside the window. Smiling, I then turned towards the commander. However, the sight of him made me frown. His suit was gone and he was completely naked, but that was not the worrying part. Although he was no longer a skeleton, his body was severely thin. He looked like he was malnourished, as if there was no fat or muscle between his skin and bone. Looking towards me, we locked eyes for a couple of seconds before he turned his head towards the monitor that looked towards the aft of the spacecraft. Briefly, his eyes went towards the monitor that showed the drive compartment, before he suddenly pressed himself back against his seat. It's coming after us, he muttered his final words, as the sounds of various alarms echoed inside the cockpit. With that Commander Johnson had died. He had brought us home, but not everyone made it. Just like the Commander, the four crew members at the lower deck and Dien had died. All of them were returned to their original forms, but a quick examination of their bodies showed that their insides were not in the right place. Bones poked at all the wrong places and a quick x-ray of their bodies revealed that their organs were all in the wrong places. Dian also had her insides in the wrong places, but it was much harder to tell due to her charged body. I somehow got lucky that I didn't have any permanent damage, while Harold was even luckier for not having been affected by that universe. I assumed that we managed to get out just in time before it could target him. Sadly, I don't think our hardships are over yet. When we materialized back to our universe, the propulsion engines the commander had engaged were still in 100% power. By the time I had turned all four of them off, its push had already slingshot us out of the orbit of the moon. Calculations from the navigational computer show that we are currently in a trajectory that would make the spacecraft enter the Earth's atmosphere. This spacecraft is a dedicated interuniversal explorer and was never meant to enter the atmosphere. Because of that Harold and I know that we would burn up if we don't do anything. However, a simple course correction currently cannot be done. The vessel took damage during the last jump, which resulted in the damage to five compartments, the reaction control system, and the communications. Harold is trying to repair the reaction control systems, while I'm trying to repair communications. If I'm successful, 
then maybe we can get a hold of NASA, who can then aid us in the repair of the reaction controls. However, it's been two days since we began our work and we don't seem to be anywhere near close to getting any of the systems operational. At the moment we have less than 24 hours left before the spacecraft enters the atmosphere. With the possibility of failure high, I decided to type this message. I'll be saving this in the spacecraft's main memory banks. If we fail to save ourselves, I hope that at least this message survives. I want everyone back on Earth to know what we endured. The U.S. Space Force was the first to see the spacecraft. For three days they tried to contact it, but they got no reply. Because of that they could do nothing but watch as it entered the atmosphere like a meteor. Few people saw the spacecraft burn up over the Pacific Ocean. However, just to be sure, Space Force still made an announcement that the falling debris was from an old communication satellite that they deliberately deorbited and crashed into the ocean. Almost immediately after the crash site was located, the U.S. government worked fast in order to recover the debris in order to answer the mountain of questions many officials had. However, recovery of the debris only opened up more questions. You see, NASA doesn't have a program focused on crossing universes. They never had one in the past and they don't have one now. In fact, they don't even plan to do one in the future. A search through all of NASA's programs revealed that there is no such thing as a Philadelphia Drive or an interuniversal exploration spacecraft by the name of Heart of Gold. As a member of the NASA team investigating the debris of the spacecraft, I was among a select group of people trying to figure out where the spacecraft had come from. Because of this I was able to read the terrifying message and watch the awful footage found in a memory card stored in a heat-proof capsule. This capsule, along with other pieces of debris, were recovered from the bottom of the ocean near Point Nemo. For six months a joint NASA and Space Force operation worked to recover and study the debris. This was a secret operation, since the government didn't want to worry the public about a spacecraft that materialized out of nowhere. However, I am going to break the secrecy, because there is something the world needs to know. All eight bodies of the spacecraft's crew were recovered. All of them were deceased and scorched from their entry through the atmosphere. However, a couple of days ago, one of the bodies went missing from the cold storage chamber it was kept in. Surveillance footage shows the body getting up and slipping past security. It then managed to leave the Space Force facility it was in and disappear into the countryside. So I'm posting this to warn everybody that something from outside our universe is now roaming our planet and there is no telling what it plans on doing.